you to be too. Focus on that. Just shout at you. Um, well, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to come and talk with you. Um, my name is Tina Grozer. I've been um, kicking around this place now, you know, for 30 years. Um, I came as a student to study cognitive science and cognitive development with a very strong interest in science um, many years ago. Um, at one point, joined the faculty, kind of rotated off, rotated back on. Um, so I'm over there working down the street, and if there are potential collaborations and you see something that inspires you, I would love to have a conversation. Most of my work is actually with ecosystem scientists. Um, but the work I'm going to talk about today is in collaboration with a, well, there's a piece that I've done and then there's a, and have been doing for many, many years, and then a piece that's in collaboration with my colleague, Chris Didi, who does work on virtual reality. Um, which is a whole new world for me. I'm a Luddite, <laughs> and I've learned to see things in a different way. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk with you about today. Um, I should also add that I spent um, 14 years in the classroom before I... Um, it's what happens when you don't... They don't have funding to fund you over there as a student, so you work full-time and you go to school full-time, and then you graduate, and you still got a foot in both places, and that, that actually feels good to me. So, so oh, there we go. All right. So... Um, this is someone you know who this is. So um, this is a quote that has stood out to me for many, many years. I'm just going to say a little bit about my inspiration for the work that I'm doing. And um, you know, understanding how nature speaks to us and the world that we inhabit feels central. It's, it's sort of you know, my moral compass. And as you well know, and are probably many of you worried about with our recent election, we don't necessarily understand the way that the world speaks to us. Um, and so this truly, we worry a lot about educational injustices. And um, down the street, people worry a lot about um, issues of diversity and ethnicity, et cetera. I worry about this one in a really big way, that environmental justice and injustices um, will really be something that we'll be dealing with in this next generation. So, but the other sort of big message of all of the work that I've done and others have done is that human cognitive architecture is not particularly well adapted for perceiving, attending to, or reasoning about complexity. And I'm going to talk about some of the reasons why today. And I'm going to draw from a lot of people's research, and there are a lot of citations in my presentation, but feel free to um, ask for more if you'd like. So... So some of the work in education that's focused on causal and systems thinking um, says that students distort complex patterns to more simple linear ones, that they tend to focus on the components, the pieces of a system, but not its deeper relational aspects, um, that they have a very hard time thinking between levels. So Uri Walensky and Mitch Resnick have written about this quite a bit, the, po the problem of that the, the actual causal patterns and the components are differently defined at different levels. We see this in biology when students are reasoning at the individual level versus the population level. But just about any causal system, as you start to tease it apart, you see that the, the players at different levels are different. And that they often make assumptions, default assumptions, based on growing up in the world that pull against discerning complexity. And, um, I'll say a little bit about that today, but you know the work of Mickey Chi on ontological categories that we make certain assumptions about the nature of processes or matter. We assume something's matter-like instead of process-like, or you know. So we just come with those assumptions as learners, and we don't necessarily examine them. And I would add that education doesn't help us to examine them. Um, so this is a set that I've been working with over the years, a set of default assumptions, and um, informed by lots of people's research. The list got longer. <laughs> it was at one point it was seven. It's grown to 11. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about a few of them today. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the ones in ecosystem science, because those are the ones that we're working on now. Um, I'm glad to speak to any of them that you have an interest in, because um, I know we have a nice conversation time at the end. So, the question that I ask as an educator and a cognitive scientist has to do with this idea of building causal competence, building awareness that the simple linear models that we may um, assume 
aren't necessarily enough. Um, you know, what's going on there that, that could help us to get to a different set of assumptions, what makes it hard? And, you know, just to, you know, think about a baby in a crib, they reach up, they whack a bell hanging over the crib, it makes a noise, that's really empowering and really reinforcing, right? Um, they cry, somebody comes with a bottle, they don't know that that somebody had to entertain the little first and, you know, mixed up a bunch of formula and there's a mess all over the kitchen and there's 15 bottles here and there. All they know is they cried and, and it came. You know, maybe a time delay, a um, little bit of causal complexity in that feature, um, but typically it came. So what makes these other types, these other forms of causal competence so elusive? Is it malleable and to what extent? Um, Obviously, I mean, I think it's valuable because we're all pictures of promise. <laughs> I'm quite sure that all of you reason on the other side of those default assumptions, and that's how you're engaged in science. So, you know, if you have, if, if one adult can do it, you know, one student can do it, one, you know, then it's a picture of promise. And I think education has to pay more attention to those pictures of promise than the normative you know, because the normative is very much the status quo. So some aspects might be developmental, but one of the puzzles in the developmental literature is that younger kids often look more competent than older kids. So what are we doing in education? How are we reinforcing certain kinds of assumptions that can get in the way? We saw this in our research on probabilistic causation, where we had kindergartners playing games, and they understood the probabilistic causal nature of it, but yet the sixth graders were telling us well, if it doesn't reliably produce the outcome, this is what we've learned in science, then that's not the cause, not allowing for the statistical relationship between the cause and the effect. And the other question that we're really interested in is what affordances do learners bring that educa educators can build upon? Because that's their repertoire. That's what they're going to be able to work from um, because th those are both the assumptions, but they're also the the positive side of the assumptions. Because not, it's not entirely negative. <laughs> it's, the kids bring a lot of really important background information. So let me just say a little bit from the research on causal induction, what a couple of the big ideas are that we're working with. And this is a summary slide. I'm going to go into each of these a little bit more. So there's this big idea of covariation. You, know, you have a cause, you have an effect. You see, the, you see the correlation between them. And that's how we get to ideas about possible causal relationships. Often we leap and we go too far, right? Um, but there's also the, this whole body of research on causal mechanisms. So if you know how a mechanism behaves, you know what kinds of things it's capable of, what kinds of outcomes might happen. Um, testimony research is what the experts tell us. And we, we all know how good people are at listening to the experts, right? So maybe, maybe not, right? So. Um, but testimony and truth in testimony and whether we accept testimony is a whole body of research related to how we discern causal relationships. And then intervention is kind of tucked in here because it relates to a number of these. You can intervene on a causal, on a covariation relationship and see what happens, right? Might help you to learn some things about mechanism. But intervention is the, the investigation experimental maneuvers that we make to try to manipulate what's going on. So the big story that we've kind of put together from this research, I'm going to share now, but then I'm going to go into some of the puzzles and problems with each of those lines of research that I just shared. So the story in the research is that we notice these covariation relationships. We sum across our experiences. And we're trying to seek out these correlations or patterns. We do it all the time. Very human thing to do. Um, we even try to disambiguate potential causes. So. We find that we eat at a certain restaurant, and we always feel a little sick afterwards, or often we feel sick, the probabilistic causal relationship, not always, but often. Um, and we think, well, maybe there's a connection there. So we might try eating that same dish that we often get at that restaurant somewhere else to start to disambiguate the restaurant from the dish, from those kinds of causes. But we also do seek out plausible mechanisms, and we use the knowledge that we have of mechanisms. So if you, know, you have this covariation relationship you're noticing, and you then go, oh, sushi restaurant. Maybe you know, you know a mechanism that might be responsible for making you feel ill. 
information about mechanisms can lead to other ideas about that relationship. Agency is particularly powerful. So we just, I just mentioned the baby in the crib. So think about that baby in the crib. If that's really empowering, you do something and it makes something happen, that's a powerful motivator in your causal explanations. We ask kids all over about, um, it's an air pressure differential experiment. We ask them what happens when you drink from a straw and they say, I suck and I make it come up. You know, so the air pressure, the, the ambient air pressure is sort of non-obvious to them. It's about them and what they're doing. <laughs> and, you know, but you see those kinds of agency-oriented explanations all over the place. Um, we have a number of studies that we're looking at in terms of agency now because a lot of the approaches to teaching kids about complex systems have to do with agent-based approaches where you have many, um, the kids are actually programming the individual agents, they're thinking about their feelings as an individual agent, what rules would you follow, what feelings would you have, and they're trying to predict the population outcomes. And there's a lot about that that's very powerful and can really bring their experience. There's also some puzzles about it, though. Um, not everything connects to our own agency. And the other big idea that we know about is that powerful narratives offer a means to learn important relationships. And if you look at Kahneman's work, um, availability, heuristic, you look at some of, the, some of the, the ideas about the power of narrative and the power of stories. Um, it's a way, if, if, if you think about condensing lots and lots of data in the everyday without your supercomputers, right? You've got these Bayesian relationships. How are you gonna hold on to it? How are you gonna convey that story? Well, a powerful narrative is a way of, it's, it's the punctuated equilibrium of data analysis, right? You take a leap. You kind of tell the story and you don't have to analyze all of this data and hold all this data in your head. We saw this with the kindergartners. We gave them a game to play and we, um, one of my doctoral students had a relative working with the supercomputer in Tennessee, and he actually was able to run a Bayesian approach to that very same game. And our kindergartners looked more sophisticated because they were making these sort of leaps. So they would make a leap to a certain kind of strategy. They were not pure Bayesians. Um, they were Bayesians with good narratives, <laughs> I would say. So. And the other piece that's really important to the broader picture that I'd like to talk about today is that we are always filtering stimuli. It's what we have to do. There's so much information coming in all of the time that we tend towards efficiency. It impacts where we're drawing the boundaries on what we notice. And meaningful patterns, we jump to them. They are our defaults. They are our well-traveled patterns. So, Think about walking on a really crowded city street. You see lots of faces going by. And suddenly, you notice the face of an old friend and you, attentional capture happens, you're riveted, you turn to that person and you start talking. Well, at some level, you had to be processing the information in the faces to get there. So it's not that <clears throat> perception started at the point of attentional capture, you were attending at a low level, just sort of very low level processing of those patterns. And then you saw a familiar one and went, got that one. I know this one, I recognize it, okay? I would argue that it's very similar with causal patterns, that we see certain kinds of relationships and then we notice one that we recognize and go, oh, I know what that is. So, I already basically said this about causal Bayes nets. Some of the puzzles about causal Bayes nets, the cognitive load of complexity, how do you hold all that information in your mind? If it's a covariation relationship, often the cause and the effect are not in the same attentional frame. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, it's often observational data. We work, do a lot of work with in the environment, so it's obs observational data. There's often a lot of noise in real world environments. How do you decide what to pay attention to in the first place if we're already pruning before we're discerning the data? So we have our default patterns, we're pruning what we see. We're not necessarily gonna pay attention 
to the information we need to pay attention to to notice the complexity. This is one I'm going to focus on quite a lot today, spatially separate causes and effects. Um, there's also a concept that they employ called directed acyclic graphs, and they talk about the antecedents to an event, you know, what preceded what, and sort of they show it in a linear fashion, what falls out of what. Um, we talk about patterns that are quite different in the causal complexity research. So when we talk about air pressure differentials, we're asking kids to think about relational causalities. How does the relationship between two variables lead to an outcome? Um, so it's, it's a little different than, this it, than an impact diagram, I would say, that sort of shows this makes this makes this happen. There is also the research on what people call specific generative mechanisms. So there are some challenges here, too. Kids have a lot of experience with different kinds of mechanisms. Um, but often, you know, you have non-obvious mechanisms, and they're competing with the ones you can see. Kids will look for a non-obvious mechanism if there's no other explanation. But if there's a handy, <laughs> obvious explanation nearby, it's really easy to jump to that. And there's the issue of defining it at different levels. And then the question of testimony. Do we really, um, can it support complex causal connection making? It interacts with mechanism knowledge. You have to believe how the mechanism works. That it's not just this magic thing, right? Um, all of the, the research on availability heuristics says sometimes it serves us well and sometimes it leads us quite far from the data, right? Although we kind of, we're kind of playing with this idea, is it a partial answer? You know, there are points, points where you have to leap, but, you know, trust in science is a really, is a well-studied and sticky issue. So I'm not going to argue that we should teach causal complexity that way. So one of the projects that we did and spent quite a lot of time on is the Causal Learning the Classroom and Beyond project. And um, this was part of a career award from the National Science Foundation. Um, and they gave us lots of time and um, supported my students, which was great. And um, the big idea here that we looked at was how particular modes of causal induction interact with the context in which, it, in which it's studied and therefore influence how we reason and understand complexity. So, you know, the lab studies, if the things you need to pay attention to are sitting on the table in front of you, you're going to reason about them, right? And, but, but with complexity, the ontological problem is really big. How do you choose what to reason about? Classroom research, we um, you know, have certain things going on in the classroom. And then real world observation, some people study that, you know, look that way to see what kids are doing in the real world. Um, but each of these mechanisms, is complicated when you're looking at a concept like, well, I'm going to show you, let me, let me share the developmental concept first, and then I'll share the concept that we're, we're looking at. So in action at a distance, this is this concept that un, young kids expect causes and effects to touch each other. So they're, they're physically touching, and objects come into contact, and they expect that they'll cause something to happen. But they're very puzzled by things like shadows, because a shadow, if you think about you know, you move something, if you move the wall, the shadow is not moving, right? If you move the object or the source of light, the, the, the shadow is moving around, but it's not touching it. So things like that can be very confusing to kids. But the research also shows that they can learn some cases. So magnets, remote controls, um, sometimes we get inspiration from our kids. So. My kid, when he was in fourth grade, said to me, he said, Mom, he said, look, I'm on a webcam, and I'm watching a beach in Florida. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> Let me see what you're watching. And he said, and the people don't even know. I'm like, oh, great. So then he said, and if I wait a f X number of minutes, I can take control of it and move it. And he showed me how he could manipulate it. Turned out it was actually in his uncle's town. His uncle doesn't know this camera exists. Then he says to me, he said, I can show you a discotheque in Russia, too. I'm like, give me that thing. It was on his iPod, <laughs> his brand new iPod. And so then he said, a goat cam in Western Mass, would that be OK? I'm like, that's OK. You can have it back. So you know, goat's laying on the camera. 
So they can learn about it. They can learn that they can manipulate things far away. Um, not in lab studies, you're not going to be able to study that, unless, I guess unless you give them a remote control device, but the studies haven't. Um, so I don't think I need to say anything about that. I sometimes put this up for my folks who like to spend all their time in labs. <laughs> I think that you guys will get this because you're scientists. Um, so for the kinds of problems that we're studying, the complex, these, com these authentic con con contexts transform the actual problem. So the ontological problem, you know, how do you, pay, how do you know what to pay attention to in the first place? So we've been studying action at an attentional distance. And here what you have are these spatially discontinuous causes and effects. You know, when I ask people, how many of you drove a car today? They put their hands up. How many of you thought about a polar bear when you got in the car? Well, of course not. We don't do that. We prune what we pay attention to. Um, some of you may know I really, um, do you know the Nissan Leaf commercial with the polar bear? And the, not I should have played it. Well, polar bear walks down from New Jersey, after it walks down from the North Pole to a New Jersey neighborhood, and you see it walking up to this fellow, and you think this guy's in for it now, right? And the polar bear gives him a hug. And in a sense, what they've done is they've taken these attentionally distant things, put them in the same attentional frame, and they've kind of said to you, if you purchase this car, you don't have to think about the polar bear every day because you already thought about him when you bought the car. Um, but the idea here is that you have these different attentional frames. Very clever things like this address the same concept. We see these all over Cambridge and Boston, right? Just a little reminder that the cause and the effect are not in the same attentional frame. So why is that so important? So you don't have covariation to reason about when you don't have them in the same attentional frame. You can't see the covariation relationship. Um, the kids we work with don't know much about the mechanisms for things like climate change. And if you're not learning the mechanism and able to reason back from the mechanism, you don't have that. And this is my pessimistic self. I don't think people listen enough to scientists to listen to the testimony. Um, perhaps the present. I don't. I should. I probably should stop making political comments. But I just think that not everyone trusts testimony. Let's leave it at that. Um, we also see the same kinds of puzzles in science education when they're in different attentional spaces. Students experience a lot of difficulties. These are very hard concepts for lots of other reasons. That's not the only reason. So we looked at a series, uh, we did a series of studies with kindergartners, second grade, fourth grade, and sixth grade. We tried to build on their affordances, you know, after having the experience with the iPod and the kid. I thought, okay, let's see what, the, what kids of different ages know about this. We spent a lot of time first just observing in classrooms and on, in playgr on playgrounds. We did a, a series of interviews. We then curated opportunities in the classroom, cafeteria and elsewhere, to see how kids would think about these forms of complexity. Um, and we did some classroom interventions. Um, so we used open-ended and forced choice scenarios about action and intentional distance. Um, we looked at what kinds of reasoning patterns and problem features the kids actually noticed. And we looked at the variation between and within their responses. Um, these were in schools all around here. So some schools you would probably know. We spent some time at the Banneker. We were downtown Boston. And we did both emergent coding, looking at the patterns in the data, but also applying top-down from our theories what we thought might be going on. So students tended to give local responses. And we would argue that that's a very reasonable thing to do. If you see something happen, if you see a cause, or a potential cause, or you see something happen, you look for a local cause to explain it. That's the most efficient thing to do. You do that before you start looking far away. Of course, if you're an ecosystem scientist, you can't stop there, and that's of great interest to us in our work on ecosystem science. The interesting thing was that we saw local responses persisting across the different types of scenarios. So we had natural science scenarios, social scenarios, um, different types of science problems, technology, and we saw it across um, both the scenarios and across the different grades. Very little difference. So no, no learning about possibilities that was discernible from the kindergartners to the sixth graders. Um, however, enforced choice opportunities where, well, actually, 
they, they, these weren't forced choice. These were um, multiple choice. You could choose a certain number of responses. Kids chose at the same rate explanations that had an action and attentional distance character. Um, they couldn't generate them necessarily, but they were able to pick them out, and, and they didn't necessarily dislike them for any reason. So they, at about the same rate. And they, some students did construct distal responses. Um, these were our various problem sources. So I think I'm going to go to this chart. I think this is probably more helpful. So this is our local and distal. And then this is here when we gave them a multiple choice opportunity. They, that they couldn't generate the con so so what we want to know is do they inherently dislike these kinds of explanations or can they just not think of them and what we tried to do is control as much as possible for the kinds of com co components in the explanations we didn't want to introduce something that sounded wildly interesting so we tried to create examples that had the same stuff differently explained so yeah um, and we did see students generating distal responses. And when they did, they were drawing on prior knowledge. They were things that they had learned about before. Um, and I would say that over the course of this study, kids started to realize, you know, there's problem sets. You have these researchers coming and asking questions, right? And these are things that they understood the mechanisms about, uh, for. And so they started to realize that there's this thing that you can have causes and effects that are far apart in space and time. So, Mechanism was really key. And this is maybe sounds less extraordinary to all of you who work in the sciences, but in education, the idea that you need to teach this deep mechanism knowledge, there are great debates about situated versus generic cognition and the role of each. And it gets dichotomized, I mean, in a way that I don't think is productive. Um, but understanding mechanisms and how they act got kids quite far in our work. So then we went into the classroom and we decided we would try to teach some of these ideas. And we, we infused this into regular units on climate change. So we took the Facing the Future curriculum and inserted these in. We controlled for time on task and things like that and um, added these pieces and this conversation. Um, this is online, so um, you are welcome to look at our, we have a website it's attached to my faculty page and it has this curriculum is there. So there were 325 sixth graders, 14 classes, seven schools. They had pre and post. Um, we had a couple of different inventories and two independent coders. And what we saw when we went from contact or physical touching towards action at an attentional distance is that um, these are the gains. So as kids experienced this conversation, they started to pay attention to the possibility. And it's not that they didn't, so I'm showing you gain scores, so that makes it a little hard to see. It's not that they left these explanations behind, and nor would we want them to, um, but that they started to realize that there were other kinds of explanations that could be valid. Um, so the next thing that we did well, what we're doing, I should say, corresponding with the work that I was, I'm doing with Chris Didi, is we started to think about, well, how do you teach these things in a way that attends to the ontological problem? What do we pay attention to in the world? So, you know, we're instructing kids. That's not my favorite way of teaching them. We like to do inquiry-based. We like to sort of get it from them, right? So how do we start to influence what they see in the world and what they start to attend to. So we know we can teach them the reasoning. That's great, that's a good start. But we also know that transfer is a really intractable problem, that lots of times kids do things in the classroom that they'll never do outside. Marsha Lynn has this whole series of studies and, you know, and, and, the, and you know, one of the predominant themes that came out of it is the kids said you know, that Newtonian physics is what happens in the science room and not on the playground. You know. Um, she has some famous quotes about that. So, so the idea is how do we start to really look at this problem of perception, attention, and reasoning 
and get kids to be metacognitive about what they are and are not doing so that they start to become different thinkers about their world, given our tendency to prune concepts and to be efficient and pay attention to what's in front of us. And for a lot of them, that's actually their cell phone or their iPhone. It's not what's in the world. So we have other challenges too, right? But um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our EcoMove studies. But we were working with scientists at the Cary Institute and looking at how do they approach understanding an ecosystem. You know, so they're thinking about spatial scales that are, I would say, action at an attentional distance, um, where the impacts are felt very far from their causes, broad, broad systems, um, you know, water systems, um, watersheds, things like that. Time delays between causes and effects. And, you know, both of these work together, processes and steady states. You know, we often are drawn to events. We pay attention to events. It's attentional capture. Um, politicians know it. After 9-11, you know, we were ready to invest a lot of money into addressing global terrorism, right? Climate change can impact our lives in a much maybe less probabilistic way, some probabilistic, you know, in terms of the weather patterns, et cetera. But you know, we're doing it to ourselves, first of all. It's harder if there's not an intentional agent doing it to us. Hard to look in the mirror and say, oh, it's us, right? But it's also something that's unfolding over time. And one of the things, I would go to meetings with 20 or so scientists, and including Jim McCarthy, heavy international plan on climate change, to people who really thought about these questions. And one of the puzzles is, you know, until it was something event-like that grabbed people's attention, it was harder to galvanize attention and resources to address climate change issues. So, you know, as terrible as um, Hurricane Sandy and Katrina were, in a sense, people started when there was water, as Al Gore said when he was here, when there was water in, the, in New York City, and, you know, they, first they said that'll never happen, you know, and then when they saw it, it got people's attention. So how do we start to shift kids' attention to these kinds of things in, in the sciences and the way that they think about causal dynamics? And I will say that the next generation science standards are, I like them, that I think they're an, an advance over what we had, but they don't go in deeply to any of these forms of causality. And it's not that I wasn't on the, I, I, like I was, I wasn't on the panel. I was one of their expert reviewers. I wrote it up, I sent them stuff, but, you know, it was a committee decision and I somehow got on the editing floor, I don't know. Um, but I don't think, and so teachers are asking, how do I really teach causality? What does it mean to teach causality? And, and they're not really being requested to in the standards. So we developed something called EcoMove. This was with IES funding. And EcoMove, if I put, if I put EcoMove up here on the screen, you would hear, ducks quacking and frogs and, you know, and we can move into it, we can walk under the water, we can travel through the world. It's a um, problem-based scenario, but unlike most problem-based scenarios where students are given a problem, in EcoMove, they have to discern it. They have to discern changes happening in the environment over time. So they move into the environment, they start wandering around doing what kids do, and they, um, you know, they try to jump off the edge of the world, they, you know, they go underwater, they chase fish, the fish swim away. Um, they just sort of get to know the world and the space. There's also a lot of tools at the bottom that they start to explore with. So as they're traveling on this calendar, through this calendar, they can time travel in EcoMove. So they can go to different days. and on one of the virtual days, some of the kids start to notice an event which will indeed grab their attention. Then they can travel back in time and see all the things they missed leading up to this particular part of a sequence of things happening. All right? They'll notice that the water color was changing. Um, there were different creatures around the pond. But on this particular day, I think you can't probably see that. It looks like garbage. <laughs> That's a fish die off. Um, it's an ecological fish die off. And it's part of a eutrophication scenario that leads to it. And it has a complex series of causes that result in the fish die off. 
So once kids discover that, they are energized, and that's when they start traveling back and forth. So they can see that there were subtle shifts and changes. And what's interesting is we're actually working on a new version of this now, and the kids have a notebook where they're, they start taking notes about their observations, and it's great to see them make a connection and go, wait a minute, didn't we notice on this day that this was happening or that was happening? And so one of the things we're asking them to do is to think about their thinking. So the fish die-off caught your attention when you saw that, and you went, oh, something's happened, right? And they actually first assume in an agency-oriented, intentional fashion that the herons they're seeing around the pond must have done it until they realize that the dead fish are there. <laughs> so if the herons are killing them to eat them, they wouldn't still be there. But their first assumption is somebody did this, right? So then they start to go back and notice the subtle things that they hadn't noticed. This actually is a human-induced version. And I'm going to talk about EcoXBT in a little bit that's more complicated than that. There are some precipitating events in a housing development that is far away from the pond. We, we go back and forth on whether it's action at a distance or action at an attentional distance, because in a virtual world, you can get there pretty easily. It's not like taking the bus. And those of you who know, know ponds in the area, Ecomove is modeled after Black Snook right over here. So, um, and, and you know, there are things about the upper watershed and the things nearby that um, would impact Black Snook. Is there actually a fish die there? No, not that I know of. I mean, there may have been over the years, but they happen periodically in different places. And this particular confluence of events has to do with weather, temperature, the amount of dissolved oxygen, there's some timing issues as well. And the, the fish that die are the bigger fish, not the smaller fish, um, because they can exist in lower levels of dissolved oxygen. So in order to really start to make sense of EcoMove, students need to know some things about the mechanisms. So we have created little tutorials for them to go into and explore, because a lot of them haven't experienced these in their classrooms. And quite honestly, even if they had, they don't necessarily bring them to bear because now they care. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> the fish died. I need to figure it out. So now that information that they might have rusty in the back of their heads may become interesting. They're collecting data on the physical, chemical, and um, populations in the, in the pond. They can also um, go into a little submarine and go down. And um, I didn't put them all on here, but they can go down in a submarine and look at the microorganisms in the pond to see the non-obvious there. Um, and then they have graphical representations that they can create. So here, these are correlations. These are, you know, this, these are the, the patterns. So if you think about the next generation science standards, we talk about this as understanding and seeking patterns. They can't come up with a causal explanation from that, but they can start to think about what might be going on. And the kids notice that, you know, the, um, as the nitrates go up, the green algae population shortly after, time lag, but starts to go up, then they're, then they're really curious about this bacteria population because they don't know how to think about that yet. So that drives them to other learning quests. Um, they look to see where the big fish are dying. Here's a largemouth bass population right here. And then interestingly, if you put the minnows aren't in this one because you can list five at a time, but the minnow population takes off. And then they start thinking about predator-prey relationships. So they're mapping between these different graphical, perceptual, um, and numerical, because they use the data table as well, um, representations. So one of the things that we did see was that significant changes in kids' ability to think about the importance of reasoning from an event to reasoning about changes over time in processes and steady states, coding their kinds of explanations and what they talked about. Um, but we also want to know, how do, they pay, how do they think about the spatial relationships? So in a virtual world, one of the things I really like about this is that we're able to think about where do they go? This is starting to think about the ontological problem. What do they look at? Where do they spend their time? I'm the skeptic on the team about log file data because a lot of times somebody will say, oh, look at the log file data. 
they spent 10 minutes on this. And I'll say, no, I'm looking at the video, and I happen to know they were in the bathroom. <laughs> I don't even hear. <laughs> so it's like, don't tell me that. I mean, that might work if you have, you know, if you have a million people, you might be able to get that noise out of the patterns, but we don't. We're working in classrooms with kids. So, but what we can do is we can look at the video data that we have, the audio data, and the, the pictures of their screen with the back end log file data, and we can create mappings of where the students have gone and where they spent their time. So this picture of the world, and we can sort of figure out these different places. A lot of kids go right to the golf course, has to be the golf course causing this problem, right? Um, and we have mappings that show us different patterns, but one of the patterns we see a lot of our kids first sort of exploring kind of close, and then they start to go further. They see there's a housing development. Then they discover the fish die off, and they're right back at the pond. Makes sense to start there. Um, and then using the affordances in the tool, they tend to get further away again, okay, using the very specific tools. But this is where we see log file, in the log file data that tool use goes way up. So I'm going to share just by, I usually give a better advanced organizer than I gave you guys. I'm going to tell you a little bit about EcoMobile, which is a related project. And then I'll tell you a little bit about eco XPT, and then I'll stop for questions. Um, we wanted to know, how do we help them transfer this? So the virtual world isn't perfect. It has lots of parameters and constraints. And you know, how do they take what they're learning about the way they're attending and put it out into the world? So um, that is Black Snook, just down the street. And this is the upper watershed. I sadly will tell you it doesn't look like that now. It's so dried up that Cambridge is buying its water from the Mass Water Resources Authority. This is right behind my house. It's a, it's, it's, there's two parts of it along 128. This is the part just below, um, north of Route 2. That's Hobbsbrook. And you can see sort of the relationship to Fresh Pond. So we gave the kids handheld mobile devices and sent them out to the pond. And um, we gave that we programmed tools to use. So some of the tools were connected to what the teacher wanted them to learn around consumers and producers, et cetera. And then we put mobile hotspots out in the environment, and they can zoom in on things. And um, they'll get information about what's there. They'll also get, um, oops, well, I guess I took them out of here. Why did I do that? OK, so they'll also get, you can also give them sort of what's going on at the molecular level. You can give them different representations, different movies. And they'll pop up just in time as they're exploring the phenomenon in the world. Um, I think I took it out for timing. but So one of the things that we did is we wanted to give them something called virtual binoculars. We wanted them to see beyond where they were. And so the virtual binoculars, actually, when they held up the device to the west, they could see. They were out there in March, which is why these pictures have snow. <laughs> you can't have it 70 degree, looking like it's 70 out in the um, western suburbs when it's you know 35 there or whatever it was. Um, but they can hold up the device, and they can get information from these water monitoring stations up near Hobbsbrook. And they can start to reason about what might be coming into the water here. They saw that one. They wanted to know, OK, we need a map. What is that guardrail? And when they realized that 128 ran next to their precious, pristine pond next to their school, they were, they, they were angry, first of all. They are like, how can that dirty water be coming here? And um, these are kids, the kids that we studied. I'll, I'll say a little bit about the study. The kids that we studied um, had been at the school across the street since kindergarten. So they, um, they pretty much knew that pond, so they thought. But what they had never thought about was what's far away from the pond. So these are the virtual binoculars that we gave them. And we also gave them something called a time transporter. Now, if you know anything about the history of Black Snook, it hasn't always looked very good. Um, over the years, it was a trash heap at one point. And over the years, people have brought it back. Conservationists who care in this area have brought it back to the beautiful, pristine place that it is today. Um, so we, this movie, this is a version of a movie. I'm just going to play a little bit. Um, is someone we transported. So while they're at the pond, they held up their device to the pond. And this is what they would see. 
any of you who are taking classes at the ed school, this is what can happen to you when you stand up at the end of the class and linger for too long because the student featured here did just that. He also, this is his cap that he puts on, and I saw him and said, Daniel, we need you. So. Well, that's strange. Uh, I was just visiting the Nook and, well, who are you? This isn't 1939 anymore, is it? Why have you summoned me here? Wow, look at this place. This really is a survivor pond. Well, why would I call it that? Let me tell you what happened here in my day. Now, when I was even younger than you, back in the 1880s, there were lots of nooks here. There was Ames Nook, Boathouse Nook, Bright's Nook, but they're all gone now. You see, the guys at the water department got worried that all those lovely marshes would let inferior water into the big pond. Well, you know, the one they call Fresh Pond, where we get drinking water from here in Cambridge. So they went around and they started filling them up, but not this one. This is the nook that wouldn't go away. Well, the official story says that in 1889, they filled the nook all the way up to the level of the surrounding land. The water superintendent said that he did not ever expect to see Black's nook again. But then, two years later, it was back and they had to fill it again. So every day they added 700 cubic yards of fill. Well, that would fill 70 of those contraptions that you call dump trucks. But in my day, they had to haul all the dirt with horses and wagons. And guess what happened to all that fill? It just sunk. Now, one hot summer night, a great big section of fill sank 17 feet. And 100 feet away, the ground bulged up as tall as a three-story building, 35 feet in the air. That's scary. They finally gave up trying to fill Black's Nook in 1895. Well, of course, that's the official story. But rumor has it, they're still trying to fill it in. Now, we just had a hurricane here last year in 1938. And people say they dumped trees from the storm, the roof of the building, fencing, and parts of the road in there. I've heard that they even put old cars, hot pavement, bricks, gravel, cement, locomotives, you name it, right into the nook but it just sunk in. Likely, they felt that they could dump all those things in Black Snook because they built a wall between Black Snook and Fresh Pond. All right, so um, it goes on a bit, but the kids at that point, they wanted to know what was under the water. Could we, get, could we do water measurement, you know, water quality measurements? Could we, um, so, somehow they wanted to get under it. They wanted a little submarine. Um, so, you know, and. Probably while we're trying to work on science misconceptions, the, his, the history teachers are probably going like, that guy has a weird combination of 2020 hindsight, because <laughs> like, he knows things he's not supposed to know. So I think if we were doing it again, we might do it a little differently. But, um, but it changed the kinds of questions that they had. The other thing that we can do on EcoMobile is we can map where the kids are in a, in, at a real pond. This is actually a pond in Lexington and we're able to see where they go and how they spend their time at the pond. And the teacher can bring that in to the classroom and then talk about it with them. So we actually contrasted two different classes, same science teacher. We used a concept called reference populations. We use them in reference to each other. It's a concept from ecosystem science. And um, we wanted to look at what happened if we gave the kids um, EcoMove and EcoMobile together and if we gave them all of EcoMove first and then EcoMobile versus EcoMobile sort of at the outset and then EcoMove. And we really wanted to know would they transfer these ideas to the real pond about action at a distance and change over time. Um, so we had these two different classes. These were kids who thought they knew the pond, as I said. We developed narratives and we, we spent a lot of time with the log file data looking and the video data, both from the kids at the pond and at, in the virtual world. So we looked at both of those. And um, 
So we had these different assessments intermingled, seven days exploring EcoMove, post-assessments, and then the, we had an EcoMobile experience. But the important thing is the EcoMobile experience worked this way. Kids went to the pond, and they were observing. They wrote down all their observations for us in a thing called fre uh, Fresh Air, um, in, oh, I'm sorry, in Evernote. Um, and then they had the EcoMobile experience. So we, we had questions to say, you know, what are the kinds of things you notice? What do you think about when you're at the pond? What do, what do you think is important in thinking about the ecosystem here at the pond? And then they had these experiences, and then they had further observation. And that allowed us to see, do the kids who started have done all of EcoMove, do they ask different questions at the outset than the kids who didn't? So, and we had all these various corroborating data sources. Um, we can talk about that if you want. Um, so, initially, they really did pay attention to what was immediately at the pond. We did see subtle shifts in the formal assessments, okay? And we didn't see differences on the formal assessment measures between the two classes. Um, I'm going to kind of skip by this because that just... But we did see shifts in what they attended to from the outset. So, um, kids from the outset were... Actually, this is an eco-move. Let me, let me actually go to the... I want to skip ahead for a bit. Nope, I am an eco-move. I'm forgetting my own thing here. Okay, so they did. They were paying attention. They were using the terminology. So the kids who started with eco-move and then had eco-mobile brought that forward. So they brought the, the kinds of concepts, the terminology forward in thinking about the pond um, that they were at. And this was before they did any of the EcoMobile components. So that's transfer from EcoMove. Um, they thought about the microscopic world because remember there's a submarine in EcoMove. You can go up and down. And they paid attention to distant impacts. Um, the kids who they, they oh, this is, so they were also thinking about how it got like this too. Um, is more of. Whenever you have a sixth grader who's really appreciative <laughs> to people who are taking care of something, it's kind of, we think that's a good outcome. <laughs> so they're thankful to the people who have conserved the area. Um, the opposite, where the kids focused first, first they had eco-mobile and then they had eco-move. These kids were focused on the things you would notice at a pond. I mean, you know, they were interested in the geese. They were interested in what the geese were eating. They were looking for frogs. Great kid conversation, just really different than the kids who had experienced EcoMove first. And then um, after they had the EcoMobile experience, then they started thinking about where is the water coming from. It did shift in that very, that very short experience. They were at the pond for an hour and a half. It started to shift what they attended to. So I want to get to questions, so I'm just going to go through. I just want to show you this one, one or two, one, two slides from EcoXPT. So EcoXPT is an attempt to um, expand the complexity of the EcoMove world, but also to infuse epistemologically authentic experimentation into EcoMove. The kids and the teachers, too, don't think about ecosystem scientists engaging in experimentation. They don't know what forms of experimentation they might engage in. This one is an example of a tracer, an experiment with tracers, where the kids are able to put tracers in the environment to assess their assumptions about where uh, material might be coming from that might be influencing the pond. So they can put it up at the farm and see if the farm is the source. They can put it at the at another pond. They can put it near the housing development. They think it's sewage. They can put it in the toilets. And then they can, over time, see what happens in the environment. And this is our attempt to start to teach them the spatial concepts in the environment. We've just finished building this, and we're testing it in schools. So I wouldn't say we haven't finished testing it. We're still tweaking. So, so that's what we're doing now. And um, if you want any additional information on the concepts that I put up, those 11 concepts, those are all outlined in, in this book that I put out in 2012. Um, slide credits. So, like that. so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I kind of put a lot out there. Um, I know your lunch is here. And so 
I don't know if you sit together and eat lunch and talk and have, that would be great. I would love that. <laughs> I would love to have you talking to each other too. So. All right. Thank you. I'm packing up. Um, so this is all so interesting and so relevant to the research that we're doing. Um,